So this is the second lecture. So I'd, I'd like to talk about um, possible approaches to the unsolved problem of characterizing generic three-dimensional rigidity of bar joint frameworks. And in particular, I'd like to um, talk about an approach suggested by Jack Graver in the 1980s, I think, which was to consider the maximal abstract three rigidity metroid. So to start off with, I'll have to tell you what this is. And um, so we're going to go back to the definition of a metroid, which, which I don't want to repeat in detail, but uh, a metroid is a, a ground set E together with a family of subsets I, which we think of independent sets. And the independent sets satisfy, satisfy these three independence axioms. Um, so we call the, the, the sets in I independent and the sets which are not in I dependent. Circuits are minimal dependent sets. A base of uh, a set of elements of the ground set is a maximal independent subset of that set. And the rank of a subset of the ground set is, is uh, the size of a maximal independent subset. And then for the, um, the ground set itself, we say that uh, the bases of the ground set are bases of the metroid and the rank of the ground set is the rank of the metroid. So here's um, a new definition, or at least it's a definition I didn't give yesterday. So given a, a, a subset of the ground set here, the closure of this subset is the unique maximal superset, which has the same rank. So algorithmically, we can construct the closure by um, going through the elements which do not belong to A one by one and adding them to the set if they do not increase the rank and throwing them away if they do increase the rank. And this greedy algorithm will, will produce an, a unique maximum by the, the third axiom of, of independence. And to give us um, an example, if we have um, a graph G, which is rigid in, in uh, generically rigid in D dimensional Euclidean space, and we consider the D dimensional uh, generic rigidity metroid on a large complete graph, and then take the closure of the edge set of A, then we will get a complete graph on the vertex set of B. So if a graph is rigid, when we take the closure, uh, so if a graph is rigid, it has maximum rank, possible rank. So um, all of the edges which do not belong to, to G, when we add them, they won't increase the rank. So we can add all of the edges which don't belong to G uh, and join two vertices of G um, and without increasing the rank. And that gives us the complete graph of the closure. Um, so this leads us on, well, not quite. Um, so as I said at the beginning, I, I want to talk about uh, a maximal um, metroid. And, and in order to be able to talk about something being maximal, I need a partial order. So here's my uh, order relation. So given two metroids M1 and M2 on the same ground set E, I say that M1 is less than or equal to M2 if every independent set in M1 is independent in M2. And another way of saying that is that every base of M1 is independent in M2, since every independent set, of, in, set in M1 extends to a base of M1. And another way of saying it is that the rank of any set in M1 is less than or equal to its rank in M2. Um, so the game we're going to play is we're going to have uh, a collection, a family of metroids on the same ground set. And we're going to use this relation to define a partial order on that set. And we're going to ask what are the, the maximum elements in this partial order. So in particular, this, this is a bit of a mouthful, sorry. Um, in particular, I'm going to look at the family of all abstract D rigidity metroids on the same ground set. 
So these were defined by Jack Graeber in, I guess, 1991. Um, and the idea is that uh, geometry is difficult and combinatorics maybe is a bit easier. So in order to get um, a better understanding of the d-dimensional rigidity matroid, then we should maybe set aside the geometry for a, a brief period and concentrate on the combinatorics. And so the way he did that was, was to study um, an abstract um, matroid, which, which in some sense uh, represents the combinatorics of, of, of d-dimensional rigidity. And he, so I'll give a alternative, perhaps simpler definitions in it later, but, but this is Graver's definition. And um, so he defines it in terms of the closure operator. Um, so so let's, let's take, I have a matroid M. The ground set is the edge set of a large complete graph. And I take two subsets of, of the edge set of the complete graph. And I'm going to be a bit schizophrenic in that some of the time I'm going to be thinking of these as edge sets, and some of the time I'm going to be thinking of them as subgraphs. So they are, I'm going to think of them as the subgraphs spanned by these edges. So the first axiom for an abstract de rigidity matroid is if my two subgraphs have at least d vertices in common, and the closure of each of the subgraphs is a complete graph. Then when I take the union of the edge sets and take the closure, I get a bigger complete graph. So th this corresponds to the, the problem, the, the, the property in, in uh, generic d-dimensional rigidity, that if, um, if these two subgraphs are rigid in our d, and they have at least d vertices in common, then when I take the union, the union would be rigid. So the second property is a kind of complementary property for subgraphs which have less than d vertices in common. So for, for such subgraphs, their common vertices act as a, a hinge, which might be a, a full dimensional hinge or a, a lower dimensional hinge. And um, the property says that if, if I take the closure of the union, then it's strictly contained in the complete graph, the complete graph on the vertex set of the first subgraph, union the complete graph of the vertex set of the second subgraph. So for subgraphs which have only d minus one in vertices in common, when I take the closure, I do not add any edges which have one end vertex in the first subgraph and one end vertex in the second subgraph. And the, the kind of rigidity reason for that is, is that because the common vertices act like a hinge, there will be a motion of the two subgraphs around the hinge. And if I add an edge going from the left subgraph to the right subgraph, I will restrict this motion about the hinge. And restricting the motion means that I reduce the dimension of the, um, the kernel of the rigidity matrix which means that if I add such an edge, I will, I will increase the rank of the rigidity matrix. So such an edge cannot belong to the closure. And um, I guess going on from the note on the, at the beginning. Um, so if we have this abstract rigidity matroid for which there, there is no rigidity matrix, we can think of subsets of the edge set as being rigid if their closure gives us a complete graph on their vertex. So we have a kind of abstract um, definition of rigidity. And um, so as I said, uh, the two properties R1 and R2 reflect the properties of generic rigidity in d-dimensional uh, Euclidean space. So uh, Graver wrote, um, a couple of papers on this, I guess, at least. And uh, his first paper showed that many other properties of the um, d-dimensional generic rigidity matroid 
carry over to the abstract day rigidity network. And in particular, um, I guess one of the more startling properties is that if we have any abstract day rigidity metroid, it will have the same rank as the d-dimensional generic rigidity metroid. So the, the rank is given by Maxwell's uh, condition. And uh, so Grave assured that, that lots of other properties um, also hold. And also that, that perhaps some of these properties could give a a simple, simpler characterization of abstract rigidity matrices. So this is kind of sum summarized in this uh, lemma. So we have a, a matroid M and its ground set is the edge set of a large complete graph. And N is at least uh, D plus two. So it's a bit trivial if ends, everything's independent, if ends less than or equal to D plus one. Uh, so the following statements are equivalent. So M is an abstract D rigidity metroid. And then from 2010, there is a characterization due to uh, Bietang Nguyen, um, which is probably the most useful for, for the purposes, my purposes in this talk. So it says that um, a metroid on the edge set of KN is an abstract rigidity metroid if it has the right rank. And also it has the property that every copy of the complete graph on D plus two vertices is a circuit in this metroid. So every copy of here D plus two, which is contained in a large KN is a circuit. Uh, and that characterizes abstract day rigidity metroids. So a third equivalent characterization goes back to 2004 and it's due to Graver and um, Brigitte and, and Herman and Savatius. Uh, and so they showed that equivalently, we could say that every copy of the complete graph on D plus one is independent in M. And that the D dimensional zero extension operation preserves independence in M. So yesterday we saw the two dimensional zero extension operation and the D dimensional um, zero extension operation is the natural generalization where instead of adding a vertex of degree two to a graph, we add a vertex of degree D. So it's easy to say the same proof shows that this preserves uh, independence in the D dimensional generic rigidity metroid. And um, well, it also preserves independence in any abstract D rigidity metroid and can be used to characterize abstract um, D, D rigidity metroid. Uh, so let's, so this is the, the big conjecture of Graver about um, uh, the maximum uh, abstract D rigidity metroid. And it, it's based on the following observation. So, um, the game we've been playing has been very generic. So I've always taken a generic realization of a graph in D-dimensional space. Um, but let's, let's uh, as an exception, instead of taking a generic realization, we'll just make sure that the vertices of KN are in general position. And so for such a, a real, so there are uh, many such realizations, and for any one of them, we can construct the rigidity metroid. And then once we have a, sorry, we can construct the, the rigidity matrix. And then once we have a matrix, we can take its raw metroid. So we define a, a metroid on the edge set of KN, in which a set of edges is independent if and only if the corresponding rows of this rigidity matrix are linear independent. So Grave is sure that for any general position realization, we get an abstract day rigidity metroid. And he also pointed out that, that if we do, so this gives us lots of examples of abstract day rigidity metroids. And he also pointed out that for any such example, um, it will be, the metroid M will be less than or equal to the generic rigidity metroid in the weak order because um, if something is independent in a non-generic matrix, it will be independent in a generic matrix. Uh, 
so he, he looked at this order. Um, so the, he also gave examples of, of abstract rigidity matroids, which, which are not constructed in this way. But, but, but still, he looked at this order and he conjectured that um, this will extend to the whole force set of all abstract de-rigidity matroids on the edge set of each Kn. So this is a, a family of matroids which all have the same ground set. So it's ordered under the weak order. And in general, a poor set can have uh, lots of maximal elements. So Graeber made the, I think, amazingly insightful conjecture that, that this particular poor set would have a unique maximal element. And more than that, he, which was maybe not so insightful, he conjectured that the maximum element would be the d-dimensional generic rigidity matroid. Oof. Uh, so uh, there, there's a bit of a historical monologue now, I'm afraid. Um, so I should have really broken this up, but there wasn't room on the slide. So the, the first thing to point out is that Graeber verified both parts of his conjecture for d equals one and two. But um, not, not so long after it, uh, uh, I think a student, I don't know whether it was an undergraduate or a postgraduate, um, pointed out that part B of the conjecture was false when D was greater or equal to four. Um, the main thing I want to tell you about in my remaining two lectures is a re re recent work with Katie Clinch and Shinichi Tanigawa. And so what we've done is we've verified that um, part A of the conjecture is true when D equals three. So we've shown that there's a unique max, maximal abstract three rigidity matroid. And more than that, we, we characterize the rank function of this, this matroid. Now this is, um, this is actually staying it the wrong way around in some sense, because the way we show it's maximal is we, um, that true? That's it's, so that, that's not quite true, but um, the way we show it's maximal is we, we guess what the, the maximal abstract rigidity matroid is. So we have a particular matroid. Actually, we didn't guess it. Um, Walter Whiteley guessed it. So we show that Walter, what Walter Whiteley's guess is true for d equals three. And then we use the fact that it's maximal to work out what its rank function is. Um, but our proof wouldn't work without knowing what the, or at least suspecting what the maximal matroid is. So five, six years ago, um, there is an alternative approach which was described by Mayor Citerum at um, a rigidity workshop in Banff in 2015. And Mayor sketched um, an algorithmic proof of the result by herself uh, Chen, who was a PhD student, and, and Andrew Vince, who was a colleague in Florida, that part A of the conjecture is true when D equals three. Um, so this is the same as the first part of our result. Uh, as far as I know, that proof hasn't appeared. But what has appeared is a, is a preprint by Mira and Andrew Vince in 2009 which um, proves a much more general result. And it's, it's much more general than, than saying that A holds for all D. So the, the last part of this modern log is a bit sad. So it, it seems that, well, it's not seems, that there are counter examples to, to the, 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 the general theorem of Citerum and Vance. Uh, so the first kind counter example I heard of was due to, um, oh, I forgot his name, uh, Joe Lepap in, in Budapest. Um, but there are now other counter examples and, and the status of, of the Sitter and Vince result is not clear, at least to me. Okay, um, so, so let's move on. So I, I'd like to move on and go back to uh, to Graeber's original proof, um, 
that his conjecture is true for d equals one and two because that's it's closely related to the proof given by um, myself and Katie and Shinichi. Um, so let, let's let's go back to, to Jack Creator's proof. And in fact, I'll start off um, trying to relate it to the the Lovas Yemeni rank formula, which I don't think is 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 Jack's proof. I think this is um, Jack's proof is different, and and I'll say why. Um, so let's give a direct proof, an easy direct proof using the fact that we know the, the rank formula for the two dimensional rigidity metroid. Uh, sorry, Bill, there's a, a question in the chat from Will. Is the method of Sivarum Vince false for higher D, or is it A itself known to be false? No. Uh, so I believe A is true. It, it, it's just that they they have a, a general theorem, which um, In some sense, uh, the rigidity metroid is, we'll understand more about this tomorrow, but the rigidity metroid is, is defined by, um, well, if, if we, oh, sorry for jumping around. So if we go back to Nguyen's um, characterization of abstract rigidity, it's in terms of the, of the statement that every copy of PID plus two is a circuit. So, uh, no, gone so far. Uh, so, in some sense, air is about these abstract, these abstract rigidity metroids in which in which each copy of KD plus two is a circuit, and the more general theorem of Sitherum and Vince doesn't just look at complete graphs being circuits, it chooses an arbitrary graph J and say, let's consider metroids for which this arbitrary graph J, every, copies of this, every copy of this arbitrary graph J is a circuit. And if we, if we take it to that extreme, then it becomes false. If we restrict to complete graphs, um, then in some sense it's equivalent to air and there are no known counterexamples. It's a, a long answer to a simple question. Does it make sense? Yes, thanks, Bill. So, okay, so, um, so we go back to trying to show that the, the, the two-dimensional two generic rigidity metroid is the maximal abstract two rigidity metroid. And we'll try and use the low vast Germany rank formula. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to show that the rank in um, this metroid is, is greater than or equal to the rank in any other abstract to rigidity metroid. So we chose an arbitrary abstract to rigidity, to rigidity metroid on the edge set of Kn. We'll choose some subset of edges of Kn. And we'll try and show that the rank of F in R2 is greater or equal to the rank of F in N. And Lovas Yemeni gives us a partition of uh, this set of edges F, so that the rank um, in the two dimensional rigidity metroid of F is given by the summing the, the Maxwell bound on the rank over all sets in the partition. So now, since M is an abstract to rigidity metroid, each of the sets, the rank of each of the sets in the partition in our abstract rigidity metroid M is also bounded by um, the Maxwell bound. So this is one of the first um, things that, that Graeber proved on the, pr the previous slide about abstract two rigidity metroid or abstract A rigidity metroid. And now it's easy. So the, the rank of um, this set F in M by submodularity, it's at most the sum of the ranks of the sets in the partition. And that's at most the sum of the Maxwell bounds. And that's equal to the, the rank of F in the two dimensional rigidity metric. So I guess the moral is that if we know 
the rank of a metroid, the rank function of a metroid, then we should be able to decide everything. And put, uh, the, the point of Jack's conjecture is that we want to get a better understanding of metroids that we do not know the rank function for. So this is not, um, that's not a good illustration of what he wants to do. So let, let's look at a second proof, which I think is closer to Jack's proof. Um, so the idea is that we use um, induction on the size of the set F. So, so I choose my um, arbitrary abstract two rigidity metroid M, and I choose some set F in the ground set. And I want to show that, um, so I assume F is independent in M, and in order to show that R2 is maximal, I need to show that F is independent in R2. It's independent in the generic two-dimensional rigidity metroid. So we use induction on F. And um, again, since M is an abstract two rigidity metroid, um, the rank of F is at most the Maxwell bound, but F is independent, so its rank is equal to its size. So the size of F is at most the Maxwell bound. And now if we just use the handshaking lemma for, from graph theory, it tells us we can find a vertex in F. So again, I'm, I'm using my schizophrenic approach of thinking of F as both a set of edges and a subgraph, um, in which the, the degree of the vertex is at most three. So I, I concentrate on this vertex of lower degree. Uh, so the first case is where the degree of the vertex is at most two, and that's easy using the zero extension operation from yesterday. So what I do is I delete V from my subgraph, or if you like, I delete all edges incident to V from my set of edges, F, and um, by the, um, the fact that every subset of an independent set is independent, when I delete some edges from F, I have another independent set. But now it's smaller than F, so I can apply induction and say that F minus V is going to be smaller than the two-dimensional rigidity metroid. And now the lemma that we saw yesterday tells us that the zero extension operation, which adds V back to F, preserves independence in the two-dimensional rigidity metroid. So F is independent in, in, in the two-dimensional rigidity metroid. So that's easy. Um, the case when F has the grade three is, um, is a bit harder, but not so much harder. And the idea is that instead of using, we use induction um, to go down to a, so we go down to a smaller set than F. Uh, we apply induction and we get uh, it it's independent in R2. And then we use one extension to go back to F. Um, so to go down, we want to use the, the inverse operation to a, one ex to a one extension. So the inverse operation, we delete our vertex V again, and then we add an edge x, y between the, the neighbors of v. And I'd like to do it, I'd like to prove that I can do this in such a way that I preserve independence in our abstract rigidity metroid m. So because we're working in this abstract metroid, which we don't know, the only thing we can use is our metroid properties. So let's, let's, let's start. So f's independent in m. Um, so when I delete um, V, or when I delete the three edges incident with V from F, the rank is going to go down by three, because every, all the edges of F are independent. So now like um, FV plus, um, so, so this is F, I delete V, and I go down to F minus V. Now FV plus, I get by adding an edge between any two non-adjacent neighbors of V. So if the claim is false, then when I add each of these edges, the rank does not go up. 
because um, it's gone down by three. If I add one edge and it, and it goes up, the rank goes up, then I'll have F minus B plus XY being independent. It will say one of these edges does not belong to the closure. So, so I need to worry about the case um, when the, the rank of F plus B is the same as the rank of um, F minus B. So I have to worry about the case when adding these three edges does not increase the rank, so it stays at the size of F minus three. Well, so now I use another property that I know from uh, Nguyen's um, equivalent characterization. I know that, that K, K4 is a circuit in any abstract to rigidity matrix. So this means that when I, I add the vertex V back, I'm creating a copy of the complete graph on four vertices. And Nguyen's result tells me that, that when I add these three ed ed edges, I create a circuit in the matroid. So that means that when I add these three edges, the rank can go up by at most two. It can't go up by three because I, there is a dependency here. But if it goes up by at most two, it tells us that the rank in M of F plus, which is this graph, is equal to the size of F minus one. And that can't happen because F is independent and F is a subgraph of F plus. So a simple Metroid argument tells us that we can find such an edge XY. And now once we've got XY, then we're home and dry using the one extension. So uh, this is the claim that we've just proved. And now I choose such an xy, such that f minus v plus xy is independent in n. By induction, I'm independent in the two-dimensional rigidity matroid. And now we saw yesterday that the one extension operation preserves independence in the two-dimensional rigidity matroid. So f is independent in R2. So this, this contains... Um, So this is our strategy for showing that uh, there is a maximal abstract tree rigidity matroid is, is similar to Graves, but obviously it's going to be more complicated. So let, let, let's go back to Graves' conjecture. Uh, so here's the conjecture, and I'd like to say something about the counterexamples. So the, the first counterexample is due to N.J. Thurston, who I think was a student at the time, and he constructed a specific metroid, which is a counterexample to B. And then Walter Whiteley um, extended Thurston's counterexample to give us a, a rich and interesting family of counterexamples called the, the cofactor metroids. So there's a, a, a cofactor metroid for each D, and it comes from approximation theory. It comes from the theory of uh, bivariate splines. So one is sure that, um, that this matroid is an abstract day rigidity matroid for all day. And he also assured that uh, the, um, the D-dimensional rigidity matroid is not greater than or equal to the cofactor matroid. Whenever D is greater or equal to four and N is greater or equal to two D plus four. So I'll, I'll show you the um, why this is true later, but the, so so what Walter did was he he constructed um, uh, a graph or a set of edges which is independent in this metroid and is not independent in the d-dimensional rigidity metroid. And he also um, modified Graeber's conjecture. So uh, I guess. Um, Given his family of counterexamples, this is straightforward, obvious, I guess. So he conjectures that the core factor metroids are actually the unique maximal abstract D rigidity metroids for all D. 
Now, if you remember, Greva showed that the, rigid, the rigidity matroids, R1 and R2, were maximum K rigidity matroids. So um, I guess this implies that uh, the one and two dimensional rigidity matroids are the same as the corresponding core factor matroids. But, but that's easy to see once, you, once I tell you what these matroids are. What's more interesting is what happens when D is equal to three. Uh, so one of the conjectures that we also have equality when D is equal to three. So the, the, the generic three-dimensional rigidity matroid is the same as the co corresponding um, core factor abstract three rigidity matroid. This, this is a difficult conjecture. So let's. Um, Let's describe the core factor matroids. So, so the first thing to note is that the, the generic um, core factor matroids come from a framework, but the, 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 D, the abstract D um, rigidity version comes from a framework which lies in the plane for all D. And the fact that, that they're based on a framework which is always in the plane gives us a bit of extra leverage. So we have, um, so to define it, we, we take this, frame, this two dimensional framework. So it's a framework in the plane and we denote the coordinates of any point by um, X, I, Y, I. Um, and then for any, we, we, want, we want to end up with something which is an abstract A rigidity matroid. So for any, edge vi vj we define a d-dimensional vector using these d polynomials which are based on the coordinates of this point in, in the plane so the the way we get d coordinates is, is we raise things to a larger power the, in the, the generic rigidity matroid these are all linear um, the entries are all linear in coordinates but now we have powers of the powers of the difference in coordinates. So given uh, this vector, we can use it as um, a row in a matrix. So our matrix, which is the C D minus one, D minus two core factor matrix, uh, it, will, it has one row for each edge and the entries in the row are given by this vector. So it's mostly zero. Um, so we, we order our vertices so that when I comes before J, we put uh, this vector. And when, um, sorry, under the column indexed by VI, and then we put its negative in the column indexed by VJ. And this, this is a D-dimensional vector. So the number of uh, columns in our matrix is going to be D times the number of vertices. And to get the matroid, we just take, um, we take a generic uh, framework in R squared and we construct this matrix and then we take the raw matroid of the generic core factor matrix. So this gives us our, our D minus two, D minus one core factor. Sorry, Bill, there's a question in the chat about the, the Graver and Whiteley conjectures. Are there similar conjectures when the matroids are not built on KN? Oh, um, so everything's a subgraph, subgraph of KN. So in some sense, you're looking at some kind of special case, uh, some restriction of the conjecture to a special family of graphs. Um, offhand, I, I, I don't know anything about this. Sorry. Does, does anybody else want to? Well, feel free to, if anybody else wants to contribute over the chat. Maybe, maybe Walter can say something more. Also, Bill, would you mind just leaving the cofactor matroid up for a moment? This slide, this. Yeah. Ah, okay. 
Is that all right? Yes, thank you. So I put the slides up on um, after the talk, or I'll ask Tony to put the slides up after the talk. Is this related to a, a, a framework in higher dimensions? Sorry, a framework in higher dimensions? Yes. Um, that you have the coordinates here. I uh, guess, I uh, guess you, so this is, this comes from bivariate splines. So I guess trivariate splines exist and, and maybe you have a, something in, um, corresponding to trivariate splines, but I'm not sure it will be a matrix. Can I just say something? But yes, please. Bob, I, I, I was started working on these because you and Bolera noticed the similarity of the appearance of the matrices. So it, it doesn't, this as stated, it doesn't relate to any kind of graph embedded in higher dimensions. You're, but it's the appearance of the matrices and therefore the matroids having the same patterns. Thanks, Walter. So it's some kind of Vandermond matrix. Yeah. Van Vandermond appears in when you try to prove that splines have one of the interesting other properties of rigidity, namely coning, going from the, the case with D to the case with D plus one. But it directly, I don't know Vandermond. It's only in that context. So there's a published paper looking at the analogies and some of those properties, and in in a in a the book of uh, for Jan Carlo wrote his 64th birthday, the book edited by uh, Richard Stanley. Uh, there's another question, Bill. Is there any intuition behind the definition of D sub D? Um, there is intuition, but it, it comes from bivariate splines, and I, I don't really have time to go into. Um, so, so Walter uh, derived these core factor metroids by looking at bivariate splines. So we have a um, we have a function defined in the plane, and uh, we want to approximated by um, dividing the plane into polygon, uh, poly, poly, polygonal regions. And then in each poly, polygonal region, we approximate the function by a polynomial function. And then we want the, the different approximations to behave smoothly as we go from region to region. So the, these are the you're, you're writing down the coefficients of the edge between two regions, and you're taking a power of it. Uh, in this case, the uh, d minus first power of it, I guess. And the, the intuition in approximation theory is to have a common derivative on the two sides of this edge certain coefficients have to become zero. So these are, it, it's all, all the intuition was already there in the work in, in um, bivariate splines. And there's, so there's a literature you, you can give your references to. When, when D when, equals two, do, it, do we just recover exactly the, um, the rigidity matroid? Yeah, when, so when D equals two, we get exactly the rigidity matroid. And when D equals one, um, we get the, um, the adjacency matrix of the graph, which is known to um, be a, uh, a matrix um, representation of the, the cycle matroid of the graph or the one dimensional rigidity. So when D equals one, we get a, this is just a one dimensional vector with a one in it. So we get a one and a minus one. When D equals two, we get uh, 
as I guess as you pointed out, we get xi minus xj and yi minus yj, and then we get the inverse. Is that okay? Yes. Do we know about the rank functions for these matroids? Uh, so tomorrow I'll tell you what the rank function of C2, C12 is. And it's unknown for higher values of stuff. I'll tell you what the rank is when D equals three. It's unknown for D greater or equal to four. Um, and for D equals one and D equals two, it's the same as the rigidity matrix. So it, it's the same rank function as one dimension and two dimensional rigidity. In approximation theory, they actually look at C to the power R and the lower thing is D for a bigger spread than just a difference of one between the two. You have matrices. They are very interested in the ranks of some of those. And as it happens, they know the answers for C to the power R and the base D when D is bigger than or equal to eight R and four R. And they're very interested in some of the in-between cases. But in between, they're not exactly matroids because you've got coefficients of the rows that are polynomials, not scalars. So there's a, a whole school of work doing that. And there's a regular seminar meeting right now trying to look at the case that has stumped them for about 20 or 30 years of C13. So that's not, that's not matroid, it's not what Bill is talking about, but there is an active uh, research program going on on those issues. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Walter. I, I should have mentioned that. So it, it has two parameters. And if, as Walter said, if, if the difference is more than one, then the, um, the number of rows in the matrix corresponding to a particular age um, is equal to, I think, to the dif difference between these two parameters. Um, so if the difference is two, then each age will correspond to, no, it's probably not that symbol, Walter, sorry. Let, let's just say if the parameters if the difference is bigger than one, then we get more than one row corresponding to the same age. So instead of having um, a matroid on the edge set, we get a polymatroid on the edge set. Because the coefficients are still polynomials, it isn't a matroid. <laughs> it's got multiple rows, but it isn't. A yes. Matroid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Each each edge corresponds to multiple rows. So a, a single element can have rank bigger than one. So if an edge corresponds to two rows, you could have an edge having rank two. This is great, thanks. Okay. Should I move on? Sure, sorry to derail it. That's all right. I, 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 I prefer talking. I prefer having a conversation than, than just talking by myself. Um, so, so one that proved lots of nice properties about the, the cofactor matroids way back in 96, or I guess between 90, the early 90s. So this is his, um, his fundamental survey on rigidity from 96. And so the first property I wanted to uh, mention is he showed that the uh, the complete bipartite graph KD plus two, D plus two is independent in the, the corresponding cofactor matroid. And this is important because it's not independent in the D-dimensional rigidity matroid when D is greater or equal to four. And this is follows from a, an earlier um, amazing result of Volker and Roff, where they actually um, determine the rank of the complete bipartite graphs for all realizations, not just generic realizations. And so because um, KD plus two, D plus two is dependent in RD and it's independent in the cofactor matroid, this means that the, 
the, gen the generic d-dimensional rigidity metroid is not maximal when d is greater or equal to four. And we have to have enough vertices to find copies of kd plus two, kd plus two in there. So I, I, I'll give more information on, on how Walter proved this in a second. Uh, so another property is that uh, the zero, the d-dimensional zero extension operation preserves independence, and exactly the same proof that I gave yesterday works. So this is common with d-dimensional rigidity measure. Uh, one extension preserves independence, and again the same proof that I, I gave yesterday works. So it's uh, we can use, or Walter used, the special position argument where he puts the new vertex V on the line through the edge that we delete. And then uses the fact that um, if we have three core linear vertices, then they form a minimal dependent set, they form a circuit in this metroid. Uh, so a new, um, an operation that we haven't seen before, which is also due to Walter, and um, he first um, uh, used it in the d-dimensional generic rigidity metroid is the idea of vertex splitting. So we have a, a vertex of potentially very large degree and we choose um, a particular set of d minus one neighbors of this vertex and then we, we split the vertex into two um, and add an edge between the two copies of the same vertex and then join both vertices to our chosen D minus one neighbors, and then arbitrarily join some of the, um, the neighbors of V to V, some of the neighbors to the new copy of V, and other, neighbor, other neighbors of V to V that. Uh, so here's another new operation. So this is a uh, uh, two extension operation, but there are various flavors of two extensions. So this one's called X replacement. And the idea is that we have, um, it's going to create a vertex of degree D plus two. So we choose uh, in our smaller independent graph, we choose D plus two vertices. And we choose two disjoint edges in the, which are induced by these D plus two vertices. And then we add a new vertex of degree D plus two and delete the, the two disjoint edges. And uh, what assured that that preserves independence in the core factor metroid. And again, it's a, it's a neat special position argument. So this is not a very good drawing, but if you imagine choosing a generic realization of the graph, the independent graph on the left, then uh, these two edges would not be parallel. So there would be some point of it because the core factor metroid lives in the plane, the two lines given by V1, V2 and V3, V4 would intersect somewhere. And we could put V on that point of intersection and then use the, um, the, the uh, circuit of size three argument for both uh, V1, V2 and V3, V4 to show that this was independent. So this strongly, this, this strongly uses the fact that the core factor live, metroids live in the plane, even the, the, D, the abstract um, D rigidity core factor metroids. And the same argument won't work for um, uh, rigidity metroids, which live in D space when D is bigger than two. So it works in two for the rigidity metroid, exactly the same argument. Um, but not only does the argument not work, the result's not true when D is greater or equal to four. So X replacement doesn't preserve independence um, in the rigidity, the d-dimensional rigidity metroid when d is at least four. So, so X replacement is useful because uh, it tells us that um, 
it goes back to the first property about complete bipartite graphs. So it's not so hard to say that we can construct the complete bipartite KD plus two, D plus two from the complete graph KD plus one, which is independent by a sequence of zero, one and X replacement operations. So Walter's lemmas tell us that KD plus two, KD plus two is independent in the cofactor network because each of these is showed that each of these operations preserved independent. Um, so, uh, so if we com also combine this this with the um, the fact that um, KD plus two, D plus two is not dependent in the d-dimensional generic rigidity madroid by Volker and Roth, it tells us that X replacement can't preserve independence in the d-dimensional uh, rigidity madroid when d is greater or equal to four. Because if it did, then the same argument would tell us that KD plus two, D plus two was independent. So there's a gap here. So there's a gap between two and four and Tien widely in 84 conjectured that um, what well, three is is the, the sole occupant of this gap and Tien widely conjectured that X replacement does preserve independence in the three dimensional rigidity metro. And I think uh, we'll say that this is um, It's an important conjecture for three-dimensional rigidity because if it's if it's false, then three-dimensional rigidity is different to um, the corresponding core factor rigidity. And if it's true, then I think it's a good ind indication that the two metroids are the same, which is, is Walder's conjecture. Um, could I just make a quick comment, Bill? Yeah, uh, this is Will Travis. So um, the argument that you gave with the uh, X replacement with the point um, of intersection uh, uh, of the two line segments or the two lines, um, that suggests that um, the uh, syzygies among the points um, are an important um, uh, are, are an important uh, thing to consider in these matroids. And um, the syzygies that uh, I'm talking about can't be coming from special from some special position because we're in generic kind of chord and it's generic situations. So these must be syzygies that come from um, the uh, Grassmann uh, uh, Pluker relations. These must be syzygies that come from um, determinants on, on gen, generic matrices and things like that. Um, yes, exactly. The, um, I, I think this could be kind of an interesting thing to explore. For sure, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's just that uh, there happens to be a nice simple um, geometric argument um, for non-generic points, which implies the generic result. But, but as you said, uh, that these things are true generically, so they must, they must be true, true for a more complex reason. Uh, That's well played. Uh, I'm always looking for the more complicated proof. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes that's the only proof that there is. So it, it's in, so so in fact that leads us on to the, this um, slide. Uh, so this is uh, this is the first result of Katie and Shinichi and myself, and we look at a new. Uh, it's not a new, but it's a, di a different operation which was also considered has also been considered by uh, Walter and uh, Jack Graver, and it's called double B replacement. So it's, we're, we're in a, if you like, we're in three-dimensional generic rigidity or we're in um, abstract three rigidity. And we're interested in reducing a vertex of degree five. And one way to do that would be to add um, two disjoint edges between its neighbors. Another way to do it would be to add a path of length two between its neighbors. Um, so 
So this is a more complicated uh, operation. So we, we have a set of five vertices and we actually have two different frameworks or two different graphs, uh, uh, which are basically the same apart from these, they differ in these two parts. And the two parts are different parts. And um, the, they could, I've shown them to have an edge in common, but they could be um, edge disjoint. That the only condition that I want on these two parts is that they don't have a common end vertex. Sorry, they don't have a common middle vertex. So I don't want to take this path and then another path with this as a, a middle vertex. So uh, we show that, that if, if this um, framework, generic framework is independent, this graph is independent in the core factor metroid, and this graph is independent in the core factor metroid, then the result of deleting the, the edges in the paths and adding a vertex of degree five is also independent. So this, this was conjectured. Um, Sorry, Phil. Uh, when you add the vertex in degree five, is that a new vertex in in the- Yes, it's a new graph? vertex. Uh, ah, I should okay. put it outside. Got it. Sorry. Uh, so this verifies um, the three-dimensional case of a conjecture of Walter. I, I guess Walter conjectured it in D dimension. In I guess Walter conjectured for the the core factor metroid C D minus one D minus two, uh, and so this proves this a special case for one two. And he also conjectured that the same operation preserves um, independence in the three dimensional rigidity metroid, but but he conjectures that. R3 and C12 are the same, so, so this is a bit of a tautology. If I, if I can mention, Chiang Seng Tay and I both were writing a joint paper and we conjectured that as one of the missing operations to do 3D rigidity. So mm -hmm. Chiang Seng Tay was working in, independently on Henneberg in, inductions and as was I and we put together some joint papers. Um, so, so, so our proof of this is, is horrendous. So it actually goes back to, to Will's comment. So we, we, we don't know a nice snappy uh, Walter type geometric argument to prove this. So instead we go back to the, uh, which was probably the original, um, oh, I forgot her name. The person who proved Lahman's theorem before Lahman, Polacek um, Geringer. Uh, so her proof of that, that one extension preserves independence in the two-dimensional rigidity metroid is, is built on algebraic independence. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you choose a minimally rigid graph, which only has um, rigid motions, and then you do a one extension. And if you end up with something which is not minimally rigid, which is not independent, then it has a non-rigid motion. And she shows, I think, that this non-rigid motion contradicts algebraic independence. And, and basically that's what we do to show that this operation preserves independence in C1 to it. But it, it's, it's not pretty. It's an understatement. But, but on the other hand, it's, it's in some sense, it's encouraging because um, as far as I know, all the other extension operations have, uh, can be proved by using algebraic independence, but they have the nice snappy geometric proofs. So, so this is at least as an example, which, which only has a horrible proof. But that means that probably if it's true that there exist things which do not, which are true, but do not have snappy and geometric prose. Um, so I find that encouraging, but maybe that's that's my provider where my mind works. So to finish off with, I've, I've gone on too long, but if you if you let me do um, three more slides, I can sketch our proof that um, the 
the C12 cofactor nitride is the unique maximal abstract three rigidity nitride. And it, it, it's supposed to look like Graeber's proof. So we choose um, a set. We choose an arbitrary abstract three rigidity nitride. And we choose a set, set F, which is independent in M. And we need to show that F is independent in the cofactor nitride. And we do that by induction on the size of F. So we use uh, Graver's result that, that any independent set has at most the maximal bound uh, on the number of edges. And it's, well, on, its rank is at most this, but because it's independent, uh, its size is at most this. And then the hand-shaking lemur and graph theory tells us that F has a vertex of degree at most five. So the, the easy case is when um, F has a vertex of degree at most three, and that's uh, this, exactly the same as Graver. So we delete V, uh, so F, F is independent in M, we delete V in three ages, and by the metroid axiom, we end up, we are still independent in M. By induction, we're independent in the cofactor metroid. And then by Walter's zero extension property, we're independent in the cofactor metroid for the original set. And then we're through by induction. So degree four is, is the same using one extension, but almost the same. So if I have a vertex of degree four, then I can give a metroid theory argument much the same as Graver did for one extension when he he used uh, one reduction for a vertex of degree three. Here we're using one reduction for a vertex of degree four. So we show that we can get an independent set by deleting V and adding some edge between its neighbors. By induction, we're still independent in the core factor metroid. And then by Walter's um, result that one extension preserves independence, we get back to the original set F and we're independent in the core factor metroid. So the final slide is, is the more complicated case when V has degree five. So we start with our vertex at degree five and we want to delete it and add two edges. And um, as I said before, we can either add two disjoint edges or we can add a part of length two. And we can use a, a similar metroid theory argument to show that um, because M is a, an abstract three rigidity metroid, either there are two disjoint edges which we can add and preserve independence, or if not, then we can add a path of length two in two different ways and preserve independence and make sure that the central vertices of these two paths are different. And then we apply induction and, and, and everything stays independent in the core factor metroid. And then if we're in disjoint edges, we apply Walter's extra placement result. And if we're in our two path situation, we apply our do, double V replacement result and we get back to F being independent in the core factor metroid. So um, tomorrow, um, I'll tell you what the, the rank function of the C12 core factor metroid is. And our, our characterization of the rank relies heavily on us knowing that, that the C12 core factor metroid is the maximal abstract rigidity. So we're going to use this tomorrow. So sorry for going on so long. I, I, I'll finally stop. Thanks, Bill. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes, uh, just a quick question. What's a snap? Can you define a snappy uh, geometric proof? A snappy geometric argument? Is that what you asked? Yes, yes, yes. Can you define that? Oof, uh, one that takes less than five lines and proves something interesting. 
but does it have a precise meaning in the sense that you use special positions or something like that? No, it doesn't have a precise meaning. It's just my rambling on, I think. <laughs> I think if you read if you read our proof that the very replacement um, preserves independence, then it will it will show you something which is not a snappy geometric argument. So, so, Bill, you, your proof is um, algebraic computer manipulations, I, I guess, is it? Um, yeah. So we, it, it's not uh, it's not a computer based proof, but, but we used um, computer the computer to help with the algebraic calculations. But, but, but uh, so when I, I guess, the proof, I went through it by hand. So, so I guess my my question is. Now you now you've seen the sort of steps you go through with the polynomials you, you were you were working with. C can you make any sort of geometric interpretation of what your your argument is? I can't. No. Um, so to compare it with the Polacek Gering uh, um, argument. Uh, so the, the algebraic independence of the coordinates um, immediately implies that, 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 that this, um, this non-rigid motion can't exist. And the, the problem we have is that when, when we, we try to apply the algebraic independence of the coordinates, it tells us that that some bizarre um, motion can exist. Now, it, it, it seemed extremely unlikely to us that, that it actually could exist, but it was real hard um, work to, 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 to show that it did not exist. And then it was just algebraic manipulations. Uh, maybe uh, Katie or Shinichi have more insight than me. Okay, thanks. Can, can I ask a question, Bill? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have a very, I have a basic question just about abstract rigidity metroids. So, if you take, if you take like metroids, if you take um, the rigidity of bar joint frameworks constrained to lie on surfaces, are, do they are, are those the metroids of those? Are they abstract rigidity metroids? Yeah. So, for example, if you take a let's say a, a a bar joint framework constrained to, to lie on a, a cylinder or something like that. And you look at that, that matroid, is that, a, is that a, an abstract rigidity matroid? Um, so, so, it's, so uh, Graeber defines them for, for complete graphs. So if, if I take a complete graph and, and I make sure that the um, the vertices are in general position in, in three space. Then it will have full rank and it will be an, an abstract rigidity metroid. By full rank, I mean it will satisfy the Maxwell bound. Okay. Is that what you're asking, Jim? Well, no, so I'm I'm just I'm wondering, say, so so like if if you take if you take the Rigidity on, on a constraint on a surface, right? That gives you a matroid as well, doesn't it? Right on the on the on the complete graph. But but its rank won't be right for an abstract rigidity. It's, oh, its rank is wrong. So you you, you want to take the complete graph on, on the on on a cylinder? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, so I think but, Tony answered it there. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 I'm I'm, I'm I want to allow the points freedom to move points to move freely in, in three space. So you, you're, you can, I'm happy for you to put the points on the cylinder to start off with, and as long as mm. they're generically on the cylinder. All right. Yeah, but if the, if the motions are constrained. Metroid, but, but I'm not happy if you start telling me the points can't move off the cylinder, because that's going to give me something different. And so, and so then I was, so sorry, just one follow-up question. So one of the characterizations you had, I didn't know this characterization is that the, it's a, an abstract rigidity matroid is one where 
So the K D plus one is independent and 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 zero extensions preserve independence, right? Yes. So so what I mean, can you if you if you if you kind of arbitrarily add some graphs to the list of independent graphs that are not KD plus one, right? So that, that gives you other examples of does that create I mean, if I said, okay, KD plus one and some other graph is independent and, I, and it's also, and, and, and zero extension preserves rigidity, will that give me a matroid? Would it give you an abstract? Well, I presume it would give you an abstract rigidity matroid if it gave you a matroid, right? If I just, if I just, maybe this is something to do with- you know, well, So if you like, say KD plus two is, is independent. Yeah. Then the, it won't because KD- That has to be a circuit. Yeah. It wouldn't just push you up one dimension? Uh, yeah, it, 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 it oh, yeah. give you a K. If you said KD plus one, if you said KD plus two was independent, it would imply that KD plus one was independent. So it would give you an abstract D plus one rigidity metric. Right? But can you, can you do something like just give yourself a list of graphs and say all of these graphs are independent? And, and zero extension preserves independence. Does that give me a matroid? It, it depends what set of graphs you take. So there is, you can't just, you can't just arbitrarily declare some set of no. graphs to do that. Okay. Well, what about uh, uh, algorithm, algorithmic uh, questions? Are you gonna talk about that later? About whether you can determine whether uh, the, uh, canonical free matroid is uh, uh, whether a given graph is independent? Yeah, so I'd, I'll talk about that tomorrow. So um, okay. we have a good characterization of the rank function. So I, I can give you a certificate of dependence using our characterization of the rank function. And I can give you a certificate of independence by giving you a a special position independent realization. But we don't have a, an algorithm based on our um, characterization of the rank function, which will determine independence in polynomial time. So that, that's a big open problem. 